trip is that four days before he died, he calls me up, and he tells me, hey, I want to know about this God. It's Jesus, salvation, like all this. And I led him to the Lord in four hours. Went to work the following Monday. My wife showed up. And she told me, man, she was the one that killed him. But you know, the thing is, is that he got saved. Premature death, he died. That's a divine appointment. Just like when you went over there, man, to that ranch. Divine appointment for God to uh, touch your heart, man. Yeah, you That's know. what he did. It was all planned out. Yeah, you know, and, and since like Genesis then, 50, you know, what God had planned, uh, the devil planned for evil, God turned it to good, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, Hello, my name is Junior Munoz from thugexposed.org and here today we're going to talk to uh, a couple of guys that are known well known and for some time uh, you know that can take us back into a legend that has escalated and has hit the streets today and uh, today I want to introduce to you Stan your last yeah. name introduce Vega. yourself yeah my name is Stan DeVega and I'm with uh, thugexposed.org also outreach minister okay and Tano Garcia I, I attend church on the way. I'm from the San Fernando Valley, and I'm involved with gang, gang intervention in the streets. Amen, amen. So uh, uh, the question today is, uh, we have uh, what's been known for many years now, uh, the Nuestra Familia and the Mexican Mafia, right? Uh, uh, both of you have crossed into that path within your time. D, you you are one of the founders, is that right? Yeah, one of the founders of the Mexican can Mafia. You, can you tell us a little bit about what, uh, where, where where you and what year and how you got involved? Okay, okay. Uh, see, there's a lot of books being written, a lot of documentaries about the Mexican Mafia, like other other prison gangs, right? But uh, this started back in 1958, right? in Tracy, California. I was there for a manslaughter. And uh, I remember uh, one of the originals was Guero Buff from Hawaiian Gardens. They had started this uh, uh, prison gang, right? And there was a killing, and they kind of faded away right, right away. Right? So I came from Preston, and uh, I started, me and a few more guys were in the hole all the time, isolation, adjustment center right there in Tracy. I remember that we started a little revolution with the guards, right? I mean, they, back then they used to give you 29 days RD. It was a special diet, restricted diet. And every 90 days, I mean, every 29 days they had to tell a type Sacramento to put us back in RD. Sacramento used to tell, feed them a meal and put them back in RD. So that's when we decided uh, to name uh, the, the gang that we started, we formed, right? Yes. And how it started was because we were Latinos, we were Mexicanos, right? And uh, back then, the white guy was our enemy, man. You know, I was brought up when, so I was born in 41. Back then, in them days, there was hardly any uh, African Americans in the San Fernando Valley or LA. And we used to be treated like black people from the white, right? And uh, I, I, I started having a lot of anger towards them people, right? And matter of fact, that's for the first time I went to prison for assaulting three white guys. When I was in Tracy, California, I used to notice that they had all the good jobs. They were in the honor unit, and they were making them $20 draws back in them days, right? So I, I used to, the guys I ran with, I used to go like this and say, uh, where I come from, we take for them white boys. I say, how about you, Atos? And they say, we do the same. So that's when we started to form a little a gang within us, the, the Latinos, right? Now, it wasn't, back then you didn't hear nothing about Northern and Southern and all that jive, right? We used to put like, I was on the San Fernando Valley, LA County. I used to put my name and my barrio and put Los. This is meaning they were from LA County, right? right? 
Northern California, they didn't put 14 or nothing like that. They just put, their, you know, their, their neighborhood, right? So uh, any Mexican that would come in, we used to go like this and say, eres mexicano, chicano, and a lot. And we just wanted to know. We didn't care where you were from. And uh, just to know, to, not, not that they needed protection, but we wanted to be there for them because back in the day, people used to eat me and la raza. Because if I didn't know you and somebody was jumping you from a different race, we would jump in, bro, yes. right? So we decided to, like, and there were some guys that didn't speak Spanish. So we used to go like this, it is Chicano. They would go like this, no, no, I'm an Indian, man, I'm an Indian. I said, look, man, we don't care if you don't speak Spanish, bro. But uh, we're going to ask you one more time, if you're a Chicano and you deny it, and we find out, you will be in trouble, bro. Not that we were gonna kill him or nothing, bro, right? So that's when we decided to form this little gang, you see, right? So we were deciding what we were gonna name it. I remember Lito says, uh, let's call it Las, las uh, Milpas, something like that, huh? Milpas. What's that? We was young, as a 17 years old, right? So what's what they make tequila out of? We're not gonna name me after no plant. To say. But see, I remember that Buff had already, already started the Mexican Mafia, but they, they, they kind of, when, I kind of, you know, so I go like this, I'm just kidding, let's call ourselves La Mafia Mexicana, bro, right? And then that's when I put this M right here, you know, it was a little M, and then we put a tattoo right here, que viva mi raza mexicana, right? Now it would upset que vio mi raza latina because we got so many different uh, nationalities, you know, bro. But that's how it started. It wasn't because Mexicans needed protection or because it was just a young... So, so at that time, you were probably entrenched in the lifestyle of the streets and, and it was embedded with you. You must have had a hardened heart by that time. Oh, yeah. Because he grew up in the streets. Yeah, yeah. See, my dad was killed in 1943. I was born in 1941. Uh, I don't remember nothing about him. You, I, I can go and say, I, I wanted to be a cop, bro. Because <laughs> I, I wanted my mom to be proud of me, and I wanted my mom to make my mom proud. But see, back then, it was, you know, it was, you know, where I come from, it's just like over here in Sacramento back in the days. It was nothing but orchards, bro, right? San Fernando. It, it, so it was that way? How? how yeah, did... A lot of uh, farmland, uh, tomato fields. Huh? Uh, yeah, you know, just one one way streets with gutters on both sides. A lot of land. Wow. Yeah, so that tell me a little there. bit about you. Well, I grew up in North Sacramento. Uh, I ran the streets in Del Paso Heights. Started going to juvenile hall around 14 for stealing cars and burglaries. Uh, about by the at 12, I was already a smoking gas guy, you know. 14, started drinking. By 16, I was an intravenous uh, meth and carga user. And I started getting into heavier crimes, you know, because I wanted to be a drug dealer. Before I wouldn't have to, you know, I'd always have drugs and stuff, and wouldn't have to steal no more. So I started selling drugs. But I kept gang banging because, you know, the clique, that was just like family, you know, that wasn't even like being in a gang. The cops gave us, they labeled us as gang members. Uh, later down the road, we just did go against it, we just embraced it pretty much, you know. Just started selling drugs, man, and, um, you know, sold drugs pretty much my whole life. Started going to juvenile hall a lot, county jail, eventually prison, and mainly just, uh, I lived that lifestyle all the way from like uh, 14 to the age of 40 years old. I mean, it took a long time to get out of that lifestyle. Even when I did get out, it wasn't until about a year and a half after I got out that I really, really to start coming to my sense and realize I really had to change my life for my kids and for, uh, you know, just to do the right thing because I wanted to be a good example to my kids instead of the example that I used to be to them. And uh, it's hard for them now to, my older sons, they still have a hard time with who I am now because they yeah, just like, they don't understand yes. who I am now because when they see my friends, people are like, oh, your dad, man, oh, man, we got love for you, man, what you doing now, you know? My son, oh, you know, he don't want to say. <laughs> you know, that I'm with the Lord now and stuff like that. He still has, And he still thinks that I'm going to go back to that lifestyle. I started doing gang intervention a couple of years back. 
uh, one of my former enemies, a rival enemy of mine, another gang member. I mean, we're in it for like 15 years. I mean, the way God is, I mean, now I'm working with Tim doing gang intervention. He got me out of my shell because I got saved in the county jail back in 97 on the way to prison. And um, I was reading the word and stuff, but I never really came out as a Christian. I, I was in Nathaniel in the penitentiary. I was a gang member all my life in the street, validated out here. I was under validation in there. So when I got out, I didn't, I didn't go, I didn't walk in the light, you know, I still walked in darkness. I didn't know anyone in church, number one, no one I knew knew God. So I went to live my own lifestyle. And, uh, but I felt uh, really bad. I had an awareness now that I never had. You know, I grew up not caring about nothing whether I lived or died and didn't have no remorse whenever I put in work. I didn't think nothing, I'd just smoke a joint, go kick back after I put in some work. And I noticed when I got saved and I went to prison, uh, after things would happen, you know, in the yard or things I had to do, I'd come back to my cell and I, I felt bad for the person or, you know, for whatever I was a part of. And um, I was thinking, man, I don't know why I'm feeling this way, but it was the spirit being grieved, you know? I didn't know that till years later when I started grasping the word and getting God's understanding. So when I got out, I, I got out, I was lost, you know, I didn't have no direction. I, want, I said I was never going to go back to that life, so I said I'm going to get a job. I hadn't worked in 15 years. I was in the game all my life. My social security number had not moved from 87 to 2001. Wow. So when I got this job, here I am getting this $8 an hour check, you know. I was uh, one of the biggest drug dealers in Sacramento and all the surrounding towns for about 10 years. I was in, uh, before I went to the pen, I was sound dope for 17 years, but first seven years as up and coming, just trying to get mine like everyone else. I pretty much topped out at 25 in the street at 25 years old. So when I got out, the old person I used to be uh, had a lot of pride. But God had already humbled me because when I went to the pen, I had two houses, my own business. I had about uh, 13 cars, most of them were show cars, a bunch of Impalas, Cadillacs, Corvettes, I mean, you name it. Wow. When I pro from Saul Dad in 2001 in June, I pro with just a shopping uh, bag with just my letters and my stuff for the kids, man. And I was like, man, it was really uh, hard to grip that. And I remember I was just talking about the Lord all the way home from Saul Dad, man. And my sister and her old man were like, whoa, man, what the heck's wrong with your brother, man? He's tripping, you know? <laughs> and he had all these ventures. He wanted me to get in business with him, real estate. You know, they just thought, they wanted me to, everyone, you know, got love for you in the street. You got a bunch of money. You got yeah. power, man. You got influence. So really, they just wanted you around for that. You know, there's really no love there, really. It's just uh, politics, pretty much, you know? So when I got out, a couple of homeboys come br embrace me. They were still in the game themselves, man. You know, took me to Macy's and bought me all these clothes, three different stores, gave me 500 bucks. I, mean, I had all this money, these nice clothes on. But I was feeling, um, man, I knew it was, I just didn't feel right, man. I could, because I had been saved. The spirit was living in me. You know, I didn't even, I read the Bible twice through in prison. I was in the born to win uh, correspondence in the mail. I still didn't grip the word because I think I had too much distraction. I had never let go of my old self. Uh, the outer man wasn't broken. You know, I was still in this shell. But the inner man uh, uh, wanted the word of God, you know. So I was yeah. like in a, uh, it was like a tug of war between my the old man and the new man. So when I got out, I started kicking with these friends of mine. And right when I got in the car, yeah, man, they were talking about all this stuff. Yeah, we still got it like this. We still got it like that, man. And we're doing this now. We're doing that now. And I wasn't interested, you know. And now I'm realizing, man, these guys, the stuff they're talking about, God had pushed me further and stuff like that. But I didn't know how to tell, man, that ain't right. You know, I'm just sitting there quiet. I'm like, man, I'm not interested. I start going to these clubs with them and stuff. And, you know, driving brand new Mercedes in these big old hotels now. And I'm sitting there with all these new clothes on. And, you know, everyone's kicking back with the behind us and stuff. And I was just sitting there like, whoa, I was at the end of the bar by myself just having a drink. Thinking, man, why do I feel this way? You know, because I was 32 when I went in the pen. I was 37 when I got out. And I thought, well, maybe I'm getting old. Maybe this is why I feel this way. Because I didn't even want to talk to girls or nothing. I just was just sitting there lost, didn't know which way to go. I, I, I didn't want, I wanted to go to work, get my kids back, stuff like that, because two of my kids got, went to foster care when I went to prison. And I always said, I'm going to get out, I'm going to be legit, I'm going to work, I'm going to get my kids. But the devil had his hand on me already. He picked me up at the gate, you know. He already picked me up. My old comrades that I grew up with since kids picked me up. So I'm around them every day. Before, before I know it, I distanced myself from all them. But I, I did see myself even my own family because I didn't know how to act in front of them, man. And they're all telling me, all you gotta do is get a job. All you gotta do is do this and that. They didn't know I was a broken man inside, you know? I needed God, you know? But I didn't know that. I didn't know what I needed. All I know that I was feeling like uh, 
I didn't understand what the feelings I was having inside because my spirit was really uh, grieving, according to the word. I, I know it was, you know. And so we start going out. Kind of, they'd come pick me up, and um, I start not answering the door. I'd be all dressed and ready to go, you know, until they got there. I just look out the window, and I just would go back and lay on the bunk in my in my house. My dad, I was living in my dad's back room. I left. I'm on pad. I had my own pad since 17. Uh, I left at 17. The other one back home. Here I'm at 37, living in my dad's back bedroom. No car, no money. I pro with my $200 gate money and uh, 600 of my books. So I had 800 bucks. That went right away. Getting out, just trying to get my life on track. So I'm just laying there thinking, man, Lord, you know, who am I? What am I, you know? Uh, what am I going to do? I didn't know about church. I wasn't in church. I had this Bible, though, that I, um, I had this the whole time. You know, I had this. I bought this from Susanville. Wow. I just kept reading this. And there, you know, everyone wants wisdom, all the homeboys, you know, Proverbs and Psalms. I didn't really know about much else. Reading this. That looks like a, 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 an old Dillinger. Yeah. <laughs> this is my piece now, you know. This is my 32 stuff right here. So... I kept reading this, I noticed, and I'm still doing my life, but I'm reading the Bible when I was around. Mm. Every time I felt grieved, God would say, get in there. I'd go to Proverbs, and I'd read about the crushed spirit, the contrite heart that God will never um, turn his back on that. So, you know, I was being lifted up because I was going through this serious struggle, man. It was hard to explain, you know. You know, well, the, uh, the, the, the Bible uh, says in our Romans... 5-6 it says for when we were still without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly you know and, and I believe that that's what you were struggling with you know and this is a, a time I think that that God was manifesting like you said the spirit was moving in your life and D it was sort of different for you right when the Lord came upon you what happened at that time uh, you know, what happened to me was when I got out of Bolsa in 82, my oldest daughter had a little baby boy. When I got, he was nine months old, bro. Right? And uh, I was out for seven months. For seven months, that little kid was with me everywhere, bro. You know, they named him after me, little Donald, bro, right? Right then and then, when they named him that, I, I tripped out, man, because I'm a heroin addict, bro. Mm -hmm. I remember I'm all blowed out, nodding. When they baptized him, and then they started going like this. You know, that little bautismo, the fiesta that they're having? Mm -hmm. They're going like this. Little D, little Dano, little D. And I'm like this, you see. And, and I, see, I'm going to say some, but it ain't like that, bro. So I never had no biological kids. When I met my wife, she had two little girls, man. They're my girls, right? And when that young lady named her baby boy after me, bro. I used to feel like a monster. I done already lost two ladies who committed suicide because of my lifestyle. I done already been to prison for murder twice. I used to feel like everything that I touched, I you know, destroyed, bro. But when, they, when I heard that little, that name, little Donald, little D, I went like, wow, man, you know, I'm blown out. I'm blown out on the heroin. But when I heard that, like, I must have made a, a very, very, very good impression on my oldest daughter to name her baby after me, bro. I was out for seven months, but things were happening. I went to the county jail in LA. Normally, I went to high power, bro. But you know, I'm not trying to say bad things about God or something, but you know, sometimes, you know, they put me in a module 4300 Charlie Rose. It's, it's about 200, maybe five black brothers. I might look like a brother, might sound like a brother, but I'm not no brother, man. So it's cool. So <laughs> they put me in there as a trustee. Now, was I afraid? When I say that, a lot of people keep saying, no, you aren't. I was afraid, bro. But I'm the big D, the barbarian, right? I know what the cops wanted me to do. They wanted me to go in and tell them that they made a mistake or for me to, that was a BC move, bro. I can't do that, I'm the big D, bro. Or they wanted me to get hurt. So I just, I got, I got me a knife, now I'm not afraid because I'm thinking I'll take one or two with me, bro. I don't care, you know. But see what happened now, you know, I, I, Somebody took something from me, man. You know, without, you know but I, I, yeah. I'm not trusting him holding the door. They're going to, 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 to eat. When I come back to myself, somebody took something from me, man. Ain't nobody take nothing from me. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I decided I was going to kill the, the leader, right? But then there was a young brother, big old buff, 
brother, man. He used to go around taking advantage of the older brothers and the younger ones and hit them in the side of their head. So I decided I was going to take him out. Night before, I'm going to take him out, bro. I'm in my bed, bunk like this, tripping. You know, how I'm going to do it. I've done it before, no big trip, but I'm just pumping myself up, right? I don't know where, bro. See, I'm not looking for God. I'm looking for to commit bodily harm. I don't know where, boom, my grandson face appears, bro. Oh, man, tears started coming out of my eyes, bro, because right? I missed him. Then it showed me that I was going to end up in death row. I could, you know, that didn't bother me. I thought I was destined to die in death row. The pen, the county, on the streets. My goal in life was to be 28 years old. That's how old my dad was when they killed him, bro. I'm already 40 years old, bro. But then they showed me that years later when little D grew up, he was going to be next door to me in death row. And tears became like Niagara Falls, bro. I started crying like a baby, bro. That's when I found myself in a situation, bro, that I wanted to kill the dude. I didn't want to kill him. I wanted to kill him. I didn't want to kill him. All of a sudden, I felt like I was going to go crazy, bro. You know, I was being tormented, you know. As a matter of fact, Satan knew me, bro. Right? I want to share this because, see, when I was going through all that trip, see, I didn't know nothing about the fiery darts, bro, right? You know, so while, while I'm going through the trip, I want to I wanna do what I don't do. And all of a sudden, like a thought came into my mind, like Satan knows me, bro. You know, that fiery dart, he threw a little thought in my mind. He says, Atrancate, lock it up. <laughs> because I thought about it like this, bro. I'm going to kill this dude now, bro. I can't be thinking like that, bro. See, the reason I want to share that is because see, a lot of people think things and they don't execute it, but they become even worse than what was because they thought it, right? But you know, I decided I was gonna kill him, said, but then I got out of my bunk. You know how you get out of your bunk and you go like this, bro? And there was a book under my bunk. It was upside down. I pulled it out and said, it says, good news, good news, good news, good news, and little words all through the bag. When I turned it around, it said, the New Testament, good news. I opened it up, and I opened it up to Luke. I don't know what chapter it was. I know what chapter it is now, man. As I started reading it, I started talking about happy are going to, uh, happy is the guy that, that's sad. The people that are hungry, they're going to be fed. But when it got to pray for your enemies, love your enemies. But there was a, a I think it was in, in verse 23, it talks about treasures in heaven. And then I think in verse 34 or something, or 35, it talks about treasures. See, everything started because somebody took something from me. All of a sudden, I don't want to hurt nobody, bro. I, I can't put that book down. I found peace and comfort in that book, bro. And I remember going to the pen. And when I went, when I went to the pen, there were four dudes from my, my tent, man, from the gang, man. And they told me, what's up with the book, dude? Don't sweat the book, homie. I found peace and comfort in this book. And they said, what's up with the book, dude? And I said, don't sweat the book, homie. And the third time I said, check it out, bro. So a lot of autos walk in this yard, ain't supposed to be walking in this yard. Sweat this book, we will put in some work. All of a sudden, they zipped it, bro, because they were getting contact visit. I ended up in Soledad Central. So I was on my way to Folsom in 85, bro. It was all I wore. I already sent work to have me a fiero ready, bro. But Lord, I was already moving in my life without me realizing, bro, right? So that was a, a kind of a switch to a different weapon, wasn't it? You better believe it, bro. Wow. <laughs> but, but, but see, I didn't know, bro. But you see, but see, God works so good, bro. You know, mira, mira, mira. Everybody used to offer me a fierro, offer me a, fierro, offer, offer me a knife. I, that's when I met Gato from Sanjo, uh, Grandpa from Sanjo. All them, you know, I didn't care, bro. I was wearing red, blue. I could care less, bro, right? I, I didn't care. I, didn't, I, don't, I don't come from that. That era, bro, colors, bro, right? And I remember that I would go and tell them little youngsters, uh, hey, dude, see, I would find out their names. They'd be all like this. They said, Rocky, I said, check it out, man. I don't run nothing around here, bro. But if ever your leaders want you to start some kind of battle with the South Side, they say, let me deal with your leaders one on one. See, see, the Lord was using me in a weird way, bro, right? You know? But then the verses that would come to me, like people tell me my favorite verse. How can they have a favorite verse, bro? Everything I read was favorable to me. 
But then I was reading Psalms 27. They, 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 they quoted today. Psalms 27. See, the Lord gave me verse 4. The one thing I want from God, the one thing I seek most of all is to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to dwell in this. You know, yes. so every morning I used to read that. Used to read that every morning before my devotions. And one day I woke up and I'm paranoid, bro. I'm gonna, when I get paranoid, I get out first, bro, right? So see, check how God works. Oh man, I can't thank God enough for, 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 what he, for what he, when he came into my life. When I went to read my verse, before I went out and get a fierro, I went to read my favorite verse. He directed me to verse one, two, and three. Lord is my life and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Because the Lord is my life and my salvation, I shall fear no one. Although a host and camp around me to devour me, they will stumble and fall. I am comforted that he will protect me, bro. Right then and then, you know what happened, bro? Pase lo que pase, come what may. I got a one-way ticket to heaven, bro. And hey, mira, mira, and from then on, everything was just, I started going to penitentiaries that a guy with my record don't go, bro. And that I've been Chino East, permanent worker. <laughs> the Lord was showing me, bro. Showing him favor. Just yeah. like uh, the word of God spoke about Joseph, showing him favor. You know, and, and uh, here in uh, chapter 6 of Luke, Verse 40, it says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. You know, Jesus is talking about the disciples, right? But yet, you guys at one time were training different disciples, you know? And if we look at these verses and we look at it and it says that, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So the enemy can perfectly train you too. At one time, both of you were able to take a weapon in your hand and probably show another one how to use it. But yet today, do you feel with me that what is your weapon of choice? What is your weapon of choice? My weapon, my weapon of choice is the Word of God, Amen. the sword of the Spirit, the Bible. That's all I need. That's everything I need. It's my food, my shelter, my protection. Everything I need, my peace. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The word and, of God. And, and, word of God. Me, and you stated good scripture right now. Whom shall I fear? You know? And, and, and that's safe harbor right there. Coming out of a, 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 the rough seas of life. You know, Paul talked about that. You know, Paul talked about a ship getting destroyed, yet knowing that he was on his way to die. And he came out and he told the people, you know what, man? Hey, don't sweat it. The ship's going to bust up and everything, but yet we're going to make it ashore. So I believe that today you're letting kids know the same thing. I mean, the Bible says that Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He didn't say, I will go, you know, and, and take your things or help you out and leave you there. But no matter what trial you went through, I'm sure you had more trials, tribulation. Uh, uh, you had uh, obstacles in your life. But yet you came to a place where you do, well, what is it that you do today in San Fernando? I, I, I do everything, bro. Amen. Mira, mira, I'm going to just share something with you, right? I'm a supervisor, bro, right? A gang intervention. Right. I go to Juvenile Halls. I go to the L.A. County Twin Towers and C.J., Central Jail, Wayside. Go to Bakersfield. I go over, but check it out. I'm going to just share something, man. Uh, my job is secular, bro, right? It's not a Christian job. Oh, we have Christians, right? Okay. I'm a supervisor and there's another supervisor. This Christian brother that works for us, co-worker, went to the supervisor and asked him if he could go to minister to this guy because his nephew just got shot. And he's a shot caller from this neighborhood. And he's packing. He's getting ready to all go out there and put some work, right? So the supervisor told him it's out of the grid. See, we work for the mayor's office. They got a grid. Once upon a time, we used to work the whole valley. Now they just gave us a, a certain area. That's a certain uh, like, uh, uh, jurisdiction. Yeah. Okay. We can work out of the area now, right? Contract. So, so I see this guy come with a sad face. He's a Christian guy. 
Hey, Big Eddie, what's up, baby? What puts that long face about? Right? <laughs> he goes like this. He, he, he tells me what happened. He told me I couldn't go, and I said, "Vamos, let's go." Right? When we get to the guy's house, he's there. When the mom comes out, we have so and so here. He tells. He's doing all the talking. He knows the, the guy. I don't. All of a sudden, the guy comes. A big guy. Been to the pen. And then uh, the guy tells me, hey, bro, I know what you're going through. I went through it. You know, let me tell you something, man. He starts telling me, it's not the time, bro. It's not the time to, to, to put any kind of work because police is waiting. They know he's your nephew. Then the guy comes out like this. He goes, you know what, man? I'm strapped all the time. And there's some little youngsters dogging me, man. I, I feel like blasting them, man, but I tell God, I tell God, I'm going to give him a pass. You just take care of my nephew. You just take care of my nephew. Well, he almost took out my nephew. Where's God? Guy got tongue tied, bro. The, 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 the guy with him. So I go like this Can I say something, bro? He says, he says Yeah. He says, God ain't going to answer your prayers, bro. <laughs> because you already planning to do wrong. Mm. Bible says, man, see, I can't quote it, but I know what I read, bro. And it says, a dude that prays and he's thinking of doing wrong, God don't listen to him, man. So you're not committed to God, bro. But I'm going to tell you one thing. You better thank God, because he could have allowed your nephew to die, bro. And then the guy goes like this to me. He said, well, who are you? I said, well, they call me D. Right. But this is to, to glorify God, not me, bro. You big D, you say. That's right, bro. That's what they call me. All of a sudden, you should have seen, bro. He said, because I told him, look, bro, you got a baby on the way, you got a woman, and you got a job. If you get buzzed, who's going to take care of them, that, that baby? Right? And the dude goes, it was just God, Omar. You know, it, it's just one of the things that I just wanted to share, bro. It just happened. Wednesday, bro, right? Dude ain't gonna put no work. And I says, and I prayed for him, bro. I felt led to lead him to the Lord, but the way I prayed, you know, it wasn't me praying. I, I know it was because I said, he's a grown man, he's got free will, he's not no puppet. <laughs> and the guy, after that, he shared, he says, you know what, that I was crying last night because everybody was coming to me and telling me, well, let's go, we're ready, let's go put in some work. work, work. And he was crying because He's got all this, he couldn't go nowhere. And he's, he, he said, thank you to Jesus. But you see what I'm saying? But that's what I do, bro. I, I, I work with people, man. Uh, young kids, guys that come out of the pen, women. That's my job, bro, right? Uh, but it's, it's, it's a calling, you know, it's a calling, bro. So, and you, uh, Stan, what is it that you do out here in Northern California? I do gang intervention. Um, I go to the schools, I talk to the kids about my life, about gangs and drugs. I do mentoring for Casey uh, Family Programs, a uh, foster care company for kids that never got adopted, that stayed in the system pretty much their whole life. I help them once they get out, just give them a support system. Uh, I do outreach for the Big Homie Street Team. We go out and we offer these kids um, jobs, recreation and employment um, opportunities. Just try to pull them into a positive circle and pull them out of that negative um, circle. And I just minister every, uh, every time, uh, every chance the Lord gives me. We've we got a ministry called Rome with Christ right now we're putting together. We've got grief support for mothers uh, who have kids that are incarcerated, uh, for mothers who have kids who have been uh, killed in the streets. We have grief support for them. We've got suicide prevention. And we're working on getting a reentry program for uh, people coming out of prison that need a support system as far as life skills, learn how to fill out applications, do resumes, and pretty much give them support they need because when they get out, they don't have nothing but their old people that they were around, and that's how they end up falling. So I just pretty much do a, a various uh, outreach out here. So, you know, both of you guys stand on the canon of Scripture, you know, and, and that's what you're shooting with. And I believe that, I mean, at one time you knew as well what it was, as, as I know, that to hit somebody, it's always one direct hit. But today with a canon of scripture, you're aiming at the same place. Is that right? Yeah. You know, the heart, yeah. you know? And, and, and you know, when I, I think about scripture and I think about your testimony, you know, the word of God states in uh, Ephesians 2, 
8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And you just said it right now, D, that it's not about boasting that it was you. You know, I noticed that you too stand. You put God first. Exactly. You put Christ first. You know, today in the streets, even as you've been working for gang intervention for some years, I understand. And you too. But I noticed that what it is with the secular world is that you're not going to be called until the blood hits the sidewalk. Is that true? What would you say that the system, the government, the, you know, uh, the police in general, the cities, would need to hear to change this? What would you say, Stan? Well, you know, what I notice about the schools, when I go to speak to the schools, they don't want you to mention the Lord, okay? But then they wonder mm -hmm. why there's so much violence in schools because there's no God in school, see? They don't want God in there. But when I do presentations, it comes out. I end up mentioning the Lord because I can't tell about my life, about how my life was changed if I don't mention God because it wouldn't be the truth because only God changed my life. It was never me. Um, God had to break me and then he remade me. Um, now I'm going to speak for him no matter what. You know? And they need to know about God. That's what the main thing is about spiritual death. A lot of the kids are spiritually dead. They can't receive love you know, or anything. They can't feel no more. Once you give them the word, it's going to break up that hard ground. It's going to make their heart become open so they can receive the truth and therefore have their eyes opened up like Paul when the scales fell from his eyes. And upon my life, that happened to me because I went through life as a... People say, I was a soldier for the devil. Man, you were just a puppet. You were getting played out of pocket. And then once he destroys you, he goes, you don't go to your enemy, he goes to your family next. That's what he goes to. So, but then when you're with the Lord, you become a servant. Now you're a vessel. And God, you know, he uses you to save lives, not take lives, you know. You know, uh, thug mentality exposed is exposing the works of darkness of the thug. Today we have this running rampant in the streets, you know. And if there was anything that you could say, what would you say, D? Okay, okay I just want to, not to come against the brother, he's younger than me, bro, right? But see, like, I'm in the streets, right? And uh, two things I'm gonna share. Sure, I'm gonna cover what, something that he said, right? Amen. And then the other one is, uh, be yourself, bro. That's what I wanna end with, be yourself. See, when I got out of Folsom back, in, I forget what year, I think it was in, a, in a, or San Quentin, 77. There was a guy named Geraldo Rivera, he's still around. He used to have a, a, like like Mel Griffin, Mel Griffin, like Oprah Winfrey now, right? Oprah, yeah. Okay. Now he had one. I remember. I, 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 I didn't work. I used to get down, deal. I'm looking at TV. He's got a panel, bro. Of psychologists, sociologists, and all them ologists, right, bro? <laughs> and then uh, he's bringing in kids with headbands, you know, you know, supposed to be gang uh, gang kids, right? Mm -hmm. And then after the week and a half long uh, thing, they go like this. And I'm, I'm saying this because I tell this to kids in the streets. They go like this. When they got finished, they go like this. Oh, see, this is what the psychologists and the society, I just, you know. They go, oh, the gang is a family. The gang is a family. Then years later, I started hearing that. The gang is my family. Yeah. You know, the gang is my family. So when I'm in the streets, bro, yeah. I go like this, uh, homie, your gang is your family, huh, bro? Well, why don't they go see you when you get busted? Exactly. Why don't you call them when you get busted? Why you live with them? Who buys you your clothes, bro? So I just, so I just tell him a lot. Brava, he mentioned something about exactly. puppets. See, they call them, when they get to the county, Sureño, because they gotta claim two things, Paiso Sureño, Sureño. And then he go like this, Oh, I know what, now what? Oh, I'm a soldier, I said. He goes, no, you're not, you're a puppet. Exactly. And I don't mean it disrespectfully, bro, I tell exactly. him. I'm just telling you like yeah. it is. Soldiers are in Iraq. If Afghanistan, yeah. however you say that word, bro, I tell him, right? You're a puppet, bro. See, why do you get along in the county? See, in LA, home, they're killing each other. 
Same neighborhood. That's all we do. I check it out. They get to the county. Sureños, they gotta kick it, right? Yes. I go like this. Why you kick it, homie? Huh? Like I said, but I tell you, no disrespect. I'm just gonna tell you the truth, bro. And I go to the county jail and I talk. I say what I'm saying right now. And you gotta see this about those 35 years old and everything. Tears coming and I say, man, do you tell me the truth? Why do you kick it, homie? That's the way it is. Why is it like that, bro? Uh, we gotta unite. Why? You know, the blacks, the Norteños, you know. He says, why is it? Uh, somebody, I wanna hear one word that says, uh, why is it? Those are the rules. That's for the word I'm looking for. I said, well, who makes the rules? They don't want to say the word, bro. You know? The big homies. You know who I'm referring to, right? <laughs> so I go like, oh, so you get along because you're scared. So because if I was a banger, bro, and you heard somebody close to me, and they tell me I got to get along with you, bro, you know what I do, bro? I come and pat you like this. What I mean? You deal with them when we get out, right? I'm just doing that so you can drop your gun. They're gonna take you out. And whoever don't like it, it's a, then we deal with it. That's the banger, bro. Exactly. Yeah. And the other exactly. one is, I tell them, be yourselves, I said. Exactly. See, when did I become a man? Bro? You know how old I was when I became a man? When you were 18, no. 21, no, 25, no, man. I was 44 years old, bro. When I told them dudes from the clica, que ya estuvo. I'm through. I was gonna become from the click of Jesus Christ, bro. That's when I became a man, bro. You know, when I put my trust on God. So what I mean when I tell them kids, be yourself or anybody, says, be, I like, like for instance, homeboy. I like the way he dressed, man. I like the way he dressed, man. I can't afford that. I might go, go get me JC Penny, look like it almost. <laughs> so <I'm thinking. laughs> Uh, he talked about a Mercedes or whatever. I can't afford no Mercedes. I'm gonna get my little Chevy and keep it clean like a Mercedes. You see what I'm saying, bro? Yes. See, when people are trying to step out of their two sides. Out of the circle. Yeah, and be trying to be somebody else. That's what gets them in trouble, bro. You know, the, the Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 2, it says, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, you know? And when you get that installed on the table of your heart and that scripture is written in your life, that's when you abandon your ways, you turn, make a U-turn, you seek the things of God, and then you realize that, you know what? Hey, it's over. Now I'm standing up in a fallen world, right? And that's what you did, that's what you said. That's what you did, that's what you said. Do you find it strange that today you have sureños in your own backyard? Today, we're going down the streets around Northern California and many locations that I was pointed out to, sureños live there. Exactly. You know, back in the days it wasn't that way, was it, dear? Back in your days no, that no. you remember. No. So, what is it that's moving in these kids? Would you agree with me that the devil is really busy at this time. Exactly. He has everyone on autopilot, see? They're not in control of their own life anymore. They're just like robots every day. They don't realize that. Mm, being deceived. Exactly. Well, mira, mira, check it out. I tell them youngsters like it is, bro. You, may, you do a crime and homies are around, you're going to get busted. They're going to tell on you, homie. <laughs> Exactly. See, they, they, they're passing out time, bro. Hey, homie, homie. I mean, see, there was a time, man, like, the three of us were together, and something came down. I write the beat. You mm -hmm. off. It ain't like that no more, bro. Mm -hmm. in, in L.A., I don't know about up, up here. In L.A., home, they cart you. Yes. See, I, I might be from a gang. You might be yeah. from the same gang. He's just kicking it with us. They're going to fire. He, they're going to cart him, and he's a gang. Yeah. Now check it out, we're together, I'm strapped. You don't know I'm strapped. You don't know I'm strapped. And a carrucha passes through their car, see? And all of a sudden I pick out the, the strap and start popping caps. Hit nobody. 
We get busted. You're facing the same time exactly. I'm facing. And these kids don't know. Bro. They don't know nothing about keeping quiet, bro. You know what I mean? They, they read you your rights. They don't understand. And I say, you banging and you don't understand, bro? At least I knew what I was. I knew how to keep my mouth shut, man. See, my homies used to school me. But you don't have that no more, bro. No, nah, you know, not even in prison you don't have that. Before, a person would never open their mouth up in the pen. And I was they, being they, they, validated, they, they, huh? and, um, and I was a solid dad, and the counselor was in the, his office was in a cell. You know how small them cells are. Yeah. He has my file open, and I can read upside down. I'm standing right in front of his table. All the names I've seen, uh, the 1030 memorandums, were people that I kicked with in the yard that were telling on me. I mean, you know, you start getting your eyes opened up to who you're around, you know. You're around your enemy and you're embracing them every day and don't even know. Because see, like you said, they're passing out time. Well, them guys, they can't wait to pass the time to someone else. Better you than me, don't matter how cool we are, how much time we did together, or how many crimes we did together, man. I want to go home. Push it on that on boy. So it's all about just how the devil started his whole tour here on earth. Exactly. You know, it was all about him. And he keeps it that way. You know that today in Iraq, not so long ago, I think maybe a couple of months ago, the service went in there and hit the barracks. And they, they gaffled up these guys that were in the Marines and different branches of the service for gang attire and, and giving gang signs. They had photos of them. All of them giving gang signs and everything in the military yeah, in Iraq, fighting that. a war. Exactly. You know, what do you think about that? Huh? You, you know, the enemy is so far advanced that yeah. you know what, we're taking it into the United States military. You know, well, he said it. He said, see, what he does, I do. All that stuff that he talked about right now, going to schools and all that, they took God out of the schools. Bro. Exactly. Hey, mira, I deal with kids that don't even know nothing about God, bro. They don't even know nothing about morals, it's a respect. I think I, I was training up, uh, uh, some kids to get them involved in a marathon. I used to, when I, when I was doing that, I had a brand new uh, Celica Supra, Toyota. And these kids wanted to get a, 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 a balloon from the, from the tree. They were going to step on my car, bro. They don't know nothing, bro. Nothing. You talk to them about God, they don't know what, what, who God is or what God is, bro. Because they took it totally out of the schools. They're trying to take it out of everything, bro, right? So me, my grandbabies, I, 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 they're both. They're both for the Lord. I'm I'm gonna see, I could care less. I be giving, I, I you know I I show them how to say grace. I go like this to them. And we're little. They say grace. Lord God, they all repeat. Lord God, bless you food. Make it good for my body. Take care of the poor. Thank you for the blessings. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then I go thank you Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sometimes I will forget how to uh, say grace. Grandpa, Grandpa, thank you, Joseph. <laughs> you know, yeah. But I'm letting them know, bro. See, like yes. I take them places, the barber shop where the homies hang out, everywhere. And I tell them, hey, mijo, and they're proud. At first they were kind of ashamed. I go like, mijo, mijo, why does Grandpa love you so much, man? Why does Grandpa love you so much? Because Jesus gave you all that love for us, <laughs> bro. So I'm, you know, I'm putting it in because people yes. are taking it out. You know, Joshua stated that as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. You know, in Deuteronomy 6, too, it talks about in the days of Moses, they placed the inscription of the word of God outside the doorpost when they came in and out. But, you know, what it really meant was that that should be placed in the heart and in the mind. And, you know, that we should raise our children in the ways of God, you know. You know, I commend you for doing this work of the Lord. You know, and Paul stated this. He said in 1 Corinthians 2, he said, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of the power. He states, he says, That your faith should not be in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Power of God, 
And you know, for today's youth, that's what you're trying to do, and yet it seems like you have a, just the door open, but you can't go through yet. But you know, the empowerment of the Spirit is so strong that, you know, I can see it in both of your hearts. Because the men that were able to go out there, turn around, come back, and say, well, you know what? I'm not going to fear what man will say, what he will do. You know what? People are dying out there, you know? You know, when I go into juvenile halls and I give the word, a lot of times I see correctional officers and they're there, but their heart isn't in it. When me and uh, Kilroy went to a university to speak, we told them, you know what, don't get the job for the money. Get it because you love what you're doing. You know what I mean? And, and that's an important thing that we need to do is go out there, bring the gospel into the streets, into the dying world, you know? And not only for that kind of youth, but everyone that is out there, every race, you know? Every child that's out there deserves it. You know, today we got a, a, an email from Pakistan. They want us to go up there, you know? And uh, they want us to go out there and bring the gospel, you know, to those people out there. We have right now through thugexposed.org, uh, Ray Fort Johnson's sister. She works in her ministry out there as a missionary in uh, Brazil. And they have gang members that gave their life to the Lord. And they have testimony. They'll be here. And they want to speak with us. And, and then come together and sit there and break bread with Jesus, you know. And see how they can be used, you know, to press on with the gospel. You know, and... Uh, in verse 7, he, see, he says this, he says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, you know, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, but he's, he, I like verse 9, he says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear has heard, nor have entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. You know, so today, you know, what would you tell the world? The whole world is watching this. And what would you tell the world? Somebody that's out there, Stan, is listening, wants to hear about how they can come to Jesus. And they might be a Norteño right now, bro stuck up there in some cell or getting ready to go do a mission you know what would you tell them they're just gonna they just gotta submit they gotta drop that pride and go to the lord and have uh, trust and faith that um he'll shield you you might think there's gonna be certain consequences you might go through a few things but god will deliver each time you gotta lay it down to the lord and, mm -hmm. you know that's what i did i, I didn't uh, i don't not against anyone who ever dropped out or anything i, I walked out and not, no consequences came my way I gave my life to the Lord, and he did the rest. And that's what God does. You go to the Lord and just submit to the Lord. Humble yourself, and he'll exalt you. That's what the Bible says. Amen. B, what would you tell anybody that was, is, is kind of contemplating a, and not understanding how they're feeling like you were at that time, and they want to come out of the Mexican mafia? What would you tell them? So I, I would just tell them that Trust in God, bro. You know, he loves you, bro. You know, like, that's why I shared that little thing right now about when Satan came at me like, trancate, trancate, lock it up. Because, because I'd be thinking that little, that I, I shouldn't be thinking like that, bro. That I was going to have to do it. But hey, man, just trust in God, man. Mira, here, here's living testimony, bro. Mira, you know, just trust in God, man. You, Mira, okay. I came up, every time I go somewhere, I bring Kilroy and Pretty Bob. We stop by to see one of the homies here, bro, right? And the way up here, I tell Kilroy, because he's driving shotgun with me, right? I said, hey, Roy, I would die for you, bro. Remember back in the day, I would die for you, bro, right? Right? You think I wouldn't die for Jesus, bro? I'm not trying to take Jesus' place. I made a comment one time to my, one of my overseeing pastors. He took it wrong, bro. And this is what I would tell dudes. He says, 
I'm not Christ, you see. I'm not Christ. But I use this. It's, but I've been to the pen. I spent 31 years of my life in the pen. So if you want to know anything about the pen, Ask me, bro. I'll tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. right? Because I said that my pastor kind of got it wrong. He thought I was trying to uh, take what? the glory. Huh? You like take the glory. Like if I was putting myself in God. But you know what? God then, then dealt with me. He says, I am. I'm striving to be like him. Bro. Yes. That's I'm right. not going to put yes. no let nobody put no hindrance on me, bro. Mm -hmm. exactly. And that's how I feel, bro. If I was a fool in the streets, you know, why can't I be even a bigger fool for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, bro? Mm -hmm. People talk about the front lines. We ain't no front lines. We in the mix, baby. Yeah, exactly. We in the mix. So I, I would tell that about to get in the mix, bro. You know, I tell them young sisters, you want to bang and say, bang for Jesus. Yeah. Say, he will never leave you, no forsake you, bro. And he yeah. will reward you, bro. So it's. You know, so that's like saying uh, you love the smell of napalm in the morning. You're a soldier for God. You exactly. know, you're, you're willing to step out there into the trenches, take the gospel out there in the middle of a spiritual war that we're in. You're walking around just like, hey, it's time to serve the Lord. You know that right now, uh, I just want to close right now with this. And I'm going to read you something. The Bible says that there are four things a person must do to go to heaven. Number one, realize that you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's out of his glorious standard. Number two, realize Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. The Bible tells us that God showed his great love for us by sending his son Christ to die on the cross for us while we were still yet sinners. Number three, you must repent of your sins, Acts 3.19 says, now turn from your sins and turn to God so that you can be cleansed from your sins. And four is a key. Receive Jesus into your life. Romans 10.13 says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, today talking with these men of God, men of valor, men that are able to go out there and step into this place, into darkness, being the light, having the light of the world in their life, these men know that the lamp that's to their feet will direct their path. And if they show up towards you, remember, they're bringing the gospel to you. And today, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, those are the four things you need to do. Again, come unto him. He says, come unto me, all those who labor and are heavenly laden, and I will give you rest. Though, he says, your yoke is heavy, I will make it light. You know, And his yoke is light. So today, in closing with thugexposed.org again we come to you and we're telling you the message because one thing that I found out here today is that God turned a mess into a message right here so God bless you and take care and see you soon until next time Amen Amen The definition of a thug is any person who uses violence or brutality. The definition of mentality, the attitude toward life, toward society, or one's intellectual capacity. Down the block with a pocket full of bud. What's up, cuz? What's up, blood? It is what it is, and it was what it was. Dipping through the hood, watching out for the fuzz. Sipping on the drink in the cup, feeling buzz. Rolling down the block with a big mean mug with a heart full of hate. We begin this evening with a verdict in the so called Nutcase murder trial. An Alameda County jury found Demarcus Rawls guilty of murdering four people and committing a number of other crimes in a spree that began back in 2002. It's our top story tonight. 
Police say the suspects were inspired by this video game, Grand Theft Auto 3. In the game, the players were awarded points for crimes. KTVU's Mike Meback is in the newsroom now with the latest. The crime spree spanned 10 weeks. Five people were killed, dozens were robbed. Police say a group of five men and one woman who called themselves the nutcases were responsible for the crimes and for terrorizing residents of Oakland and Berkeley. Welcome to Teens for Christ. I am your host, Jennifer Diggett, and I want to thank you for tuning in to our second segment on Thug Mentality Exposed. For those of you who couldn't catch the first segment, our same guests are here. We have the esteemed Rayford Johnson, who is the author of the book, Thug Mentality Exposed. Welcome. And Pastor LaVon Davis. So... We are going to jump right in and give a quick recap for those of you who couldn't catch the first segment. Um, if you could go ahead and give us a little bit of back, background information on what thug mentality is. Well, basically in a nutshell, just a evil and sinful lifestyle presented as cool, sexy, and, and to be respected. Like I said, a lot of the guys at the institution call it the new swagger. Mm -hmm. So, and like I said, that's what we're trying to expose. You know, Ephesians 5.11, that's the theme of our ministry have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness but rather expose them and that's what we're doing right and we explore, expose them with four principles you know first awareness knowledge then wisdom and then a mission so once you get the information you get the wisdom don't just sit on it go out and bring light to someone else that's bring them out of the most hardcore right. thug gang members you know when you present to them the truth just like John 832 says the truth will make you free mm -hmm. Something happens, it's like their conscience becomes awakening. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, I did not know that. Right. Tell I, me more. I think the interesting thing about the book and the response has to do with people really want to be informed. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that are living, they're living lies. Uh, they're not living the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to find out what they want to do. Right. And when they get this information, it is enlightening. And I think that's Amen. why I, Ray and I would make an excellent team. He brings the enlightenment about the history. Now, now that I'm enlightened, what do I do? Exactly. Wow. I got the, the information. Step. How do I get out? What do I do? And, and that's where we come in, deal with the mental psyche of an individual, deal with the spirituality. But the book has been a phenomenal tool, a phenomenal tool, and in getting information to people. And they're, they're almost like... <sighs> The thuggy ceremony. They're worshiping Kali. And these thuggies were made up of Muslims and Hindus, and they worshiped a goddess. And their goddess's name was Kali. Okay. okay, and Kali was a goddess of death and destruction. See, back in ancient times, I mean, even unto today, you know, uh, they would want to appease their gods and goddesses. Why? Because they, a lot of people don't know the word pharmacy comes from the Greek word pharmika, right? Sorcery. Which means sorcery. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Murray, uh, Executive Director of Hope, Help, and Healing here in Auburn, California. Uh, we have a ministry to alcoholics and drug addicts, if you're not familiar with our program. But um, we uh, so appreciate uh, Rayford uh, coming and ministering to our men here. He's been an inspiration, and uh, to say the least. And we, um, we're just excited every time he comes. And uh, today we had our uh, pastor's uh, prayer time here at our office. And uh, one of the pastors got so excited about it, he had to stay in watch the rest of the meeting. So 
we're thankful. Thank you, Ray. And any of those, uh, any of you out there that are thinking of having Ray come and uh, speak at your uh, meeting, facility, whatever that is for you, I highly encourage it. Uh, he's a great speaker, uh, especially to those uh, in recovery and uh, to those that are suffering from their past uh, problems with street gangs and, and issues like that. So God bless. And thank you very much. I, I happened to walk right in as uh, Rayford Johnson was doing a presentation here, and he is a phenomenal speaker. He relates to our group. He was able to bring the experiences from the inside of the institution right out into the lives and the dealing with the things that we're facing. As a pastor, he was able to give me insight on some of the behaviors of the young people that I'm dealing with. He gives me insight to why people are dressing the way they're dressing, why they're doing things that they're doing. I appreciate his experience and I appreciate the way he connected with the audience. I believe he'll do a great job speaking to my young people. He'll do a great job talking to my congregation at large. I'm going to do everything I can do to put together a, a group of people that can can sit under his training. He's got the book, The Thug Mentality Exposed. This is something that I think it would it's going to help me as a pastor and it's going to help our young people. This is a resource I've been looking for. I don't understand the things that he's talking about, but this is going to help me get to where I need to be. I appreciate his burden. I appreciate his passion. I know that the Lord is going to use him mightily. If you'll give him a chance to talk to your young people, I feel confident that they'll come out with information that will help them live the life that God intends them to live. It will correct the things that are going wrong. Rayford Johnson, he's a man. <laughs> dictate our emotions. Our emotions dictate our actions. Our actions produce our results. So I tell people, keep bearing in mind. But music and the brain. Six, six, six. I see young people after coming to his class, oftentimes the volunteers or people that come in don't really get to see the effect that they're having. But because I'm housed there, I see the difference on their faces, their expressions. I hear and see hope where there was no hope. And I think uh, Ray Johnson uh, and his program uh, can be credited with helping to improve the atmosphere in the individual cells, and I think make the job easier for the probation officers within the institution. Um, I've seen more and more young people who are now coming to his classes. Like most young people, they want to check him out, see if he was for real, if he knew what he was talking about. He's for real, he knows what he's talking about. And the staff has expressed to me, uh, that's not only the, the lower line staff, but the administrative staff, how pleased they are about his level of professionalism and uh, the quality of his material. And I really enjoy having him because what I wanted was the students to get, um, have a testimonial or an experience from somebody who does work in the field, but also has, uh, as well as, you know, knowledge about the kinds of uh, topics and issues that are relevant to my students and the kinds of things that he can bring to the classroom as well. I saw the presentation at thugexposed.org on three different occasions. The first time was this summer at St. Paul Baptist Church at a youth group. I was very impressed with it and I'd seen Ray before and so I asked for his card so that I could get in contact with him so that he could do a presentation at the Alpha Academy. He came out and did a presentation at the Alpha Academy which is a mentoring group for young men 12 to 18 and they were very impressed by it and so I asked him to come out and speak at the college to my two college classes contemporary problems of athletes and he came out and they were very impressed first of all in terms of him giving a history of different issues such as where did sagging come from uh, and he talked about that and he also brought in a video presentation the mentality. This ain't fake, homeboy, it's reality. Sitting in my 
myself again yeah. Wishing I can go back I'm so sorry and Change the things that I've done This is Bobby Jackson. I read Thug Mentality Exposed. It's a great book. You need to check it out. Uh, I have some friends, family, uh, people that I know that have experienced gang violence that goes through that. So check out the book, read it. But you also can go to thugexposed.org to check out more scenes and, and more updates on, on the book. So I, I like the whole concept of uh, the vision of Ray Johnson, the leader, you know, of the organization. Uh, I like the quality of people that he's bringing aboard to help him carry out the vision because he's a visionary leader. His experience being a correctional counselor uh, has, uh, you know, he has gained valuable insights into the, the mentality of a lot of thugs who are in our prison systems, you know, t today. But he sees hope. He has faith. He knows that for all individuals, there's hope. And he knows that these young people that we're dealing with, they have hope. Because if hope is gone, then failure is inevitable. This is what they're telling. 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 This is what they ain't 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 telling. What they ain't telling, this is 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 what they ain't telling.